Hello and welcome back to another video on our journey from the primes to the Riemann hypothesis. In the last few videos we've done some really interesting work looking at some really foundational properties of the primes, like the fact that they are infinite, or the fact that every number can be broken down into a unique set of prime factors. Today we're going to just take a slight diversion um, and follow an interesting question that newcomers, like myself, to primes often ask. So we've seen in the earlier videos that the primes appear to be um, almost kind of randomly placed on the number line. It seems difficult to predict um, where the next one will be given the previous primes. Um, that's another way of saying that it's not easy to find a simple pattern. Now what do we mean by simple pattern? So if we look at an example like the even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on, we can easily predict what the next ones in that sequence will be because we can see the pattern. It's two more than the previous one. And because there's a simple pattern we can often encode that in a simple formula. Um, let's just look at an example. So 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on. We can see the pattern, you know, there's, the jump is 2 every time and we can say the nth number in the sequence is 2n. So the first one is 2 times 1, the next one is 2 times 2, the third one is 2 times 3 and so on. If we had the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7 and so on, again we can see the, the, the similar pattern, it's almost the same, just the starting point is different. So we can say the nth odd number is 2n minus 1. So that's nice and easy. So there's a, almost a correspondence between if there's a simple pattern, we can often, not always, encode that into a simple formula, like this one and this one. And the triangle numbers are a, just ever so slightly more interesting uh, than, than just the even numbers and the odd numbers. And you'll remember, you'll remember that the triangle numbers are the ones that come from building a sort of a, a pyramid in this fashion. So the first one is one, the next number is three, because it's those. The next one is five, which is these. And the next one is 10 and so on. And, you know, it's an interesting exercise to work it out, but the number there, the nth number, is n times n plus 1 over 2. If you're interested in how you can derive that, do go and have a look on the internet. It's quite a simple, uh, quite a nice kind of a derivation for that. So, what we're what we can ask about the primes is, is there a simple formula that can generate them? And that's a question that, you know, um, many of us who kind of first start studying the primes ask ourselves, we ask, hmm, is there some formula that can generate the nth prime? It's a natural thing to ask. You should ask yourself that. Um, now, when we say simple formula, we haven't really defined what that means. Um, and one way of defining that, you know, constraining the problem, the question we're asking ourselves, is to say, well, is there a polynomial that can generate the nth prime? Now, why polynomials? Well, they're simple, but they are also rather flexible. So it's almost a sweet spot. Because if we limit the kinds of formulas we, we can talk about too much, then we might find that actually we can't generate interesting sequences with them. If we widen out our definition of what a formula is too broadly, then 
the question becomes much harder um, and probably beyond me <laughs> in terms of being able to um, answer it, to solve it. But the polynomials are a good kind of balance between simplicity and flexibility. Almost, you know, you know, when we do statistics and machine learning and all these other interesting things, um, we can often find polynomials that fit the data or we try to find polynomials. Um, we know also that, you know, some interesting functions like sine and logarithm and so on um, can be approximated fairly well with polynomials. Um, so polynomials are fairly flexible, but also rather simple. So that's probably a good definition um, and a good reason to choose them for the purpose of this question. Can simple functions that are polynomials generate the nth prime number? Yes or no? That's that's the question. So here's just a definition of a prime of a polynomial. You know, it can be a constant plus b times something plus c times that's that thing squared and so on you might remember from school you know um quadratic equi quadratics like you know three plus four x plus five x squared that's that's a polynomial and the reason we're asking this is are the primes simple enough to be modeled by a polynomial that's another way of asking this question so we could take it from the other perspective and say are polynomials expressive enough to capture the primes but the other way of asking it is are the primes simple enough to be modeled by the polynomials and I think for me that's that's the direction I want to come in so again you know we can try lots of polynomials and that that's not really a proof um, let's 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 work through a proof which will decide it you know forever um, so here's our polynomial that's generic and it's finite in the sense that there is a fixed number of terms they don't go on forever and we've kept these things as variables a b c you know the coefficients we haven't said what they are what we're also saying here in our definition is just for the purposes of the polynomials that we're interested in we want to say that these things are whole numbers the uh, coefficients if you think that's too restrictive, we'll come back to that at the end. So let's deal with the easier one first. We're also saying that these coefficients from B onwards are not zero. And the reason for saying that is we just want to avoid the you know, trivially simple case of you know, a polynomial is just a constant like Pn equals A and the rest are zero. We want to avoid that. Pn is five, Pn is eight or 10. That becomes a constant. Great. So that's our definition for now. And the proof is going to be, again, a proof by contradiction. So it's good to get the practice in. We, we talked about it before, um, and you'll find actually quite a few proofs in number theory are proofs by contradiction. So it's good to, good to see another example. So we're going to start off with something that we suspect is wrong. Let's assume that that polynomial, the simple one, does generate only primes. So that means if we plug in one, n is one, it generates a prime. Because that's what we said, it generates only primes. So let's plug it in and we can call that that first prime or the one it generates when n is one. And the input is one we can call that p1 there it is polynomial with one plugged in and when n is one it's it's just the sum of the coefficients a plus b plus c all of them there that's p1 great nothing nothing difficult there when n is one it generates a number and that's prime because that's what we've said as our starting assumption assume Pn does generate only primes. Now let's try another input. Now this is carefully constructed. It wasn't by chance. <laughs> um, and we're going to try not an input of one or two or three, but one plus P1. That happens to be that number we found previously. Now P1 plus P1 is A 
plus B times that input, C times that input squared, D times that input cubed, and so on. That's simply plugging in that value, that parameter. Easy so far? It's getting a bit messy though, and it might look scary, but we just have to recognize one thing. If we did expand this thing out, we'd have the terms that had P1 as a factor, if we did expand it out, and those that didn't, so A would be one of those terms that didn't have P1 as a factor, B times 1, or C times 1, and D times 1, but all the other ones would be P1 times something, so there might be a so if we expand 1 plus p1 squared, we know the expression for that, 1 plus 2p1 plus p1 squared. So you can, you can see that, except 1, all the others have p1 as a factor. That's just expanding out brackets. We, we were fairly familiar with that. So we can just call the ones that have p1 as a factor, just call them x. Let's collect them together. So we can write that as all those terms that don't have p1 as a factor, and then the other ones are written as p1 times x. Right, so you might spot something here. These terms that didn't have p1 as a factor, what are they? Let's go back a page. p1 is a, b, c, plus d, plus e. It's, a, it's the sum of all the coefficients. And that's the sum of all the coefficients. That's P1. Let's write that out. So we're just saying here that that, that that first bit is actually P1. So we can say that when 1 plus P1 is plugged into that polynomial, it's P1 plus P1 times x. And we can factorize that as P1, 1 plus x. We found that that polynomial generates a number which is p1 times something. p1 times something can't be prime. Something times something can't be prime. So that's a contradiction because p was only ever supposed to generate primes, only primes. But we've just shown that it can generate a number that isn't prime. Now just to be rigorous, we know that's a whole number. X is also a whole number. You might be saying, well, what if that's a half or a third or a quarter or something else? X is a whole number because it's the sum of multiplied combinations of those terms, these things. You know, it's, it's two times P1, it's and if you expand these out, there's no introduction of any fractions. It's all whole numbers. So x is a whole number. So that's a whole number. So whole number times whole number. So that's a contradiction. We've just shown that if we did say that we had a polynomial that generates only primes, we can use it to generate something that isn't a prime. It's a contradiction. Therefore, our starting assumption is wrong proof by contradiction. Great. So let's kind of recap and think a little bit about what we've done. We wanted to prove that a polynomial, a simple polynomial with whole number coefficients and a finite list of terms can't generate the nth prime and we proved that. But actually we proved that Pn can't generate only primes, and that's a stronger statement. So we started the discussion by saying, can Pn be you know, generate the nth prime? Our strongest conclusion is a polynomial can't generate only primes in any order. So what we've proved is just a little bit stronger, a bit wider than what we originally needed or wanted to prove. So that was, that's a stronger proof than we intended. Fantastic. So we could stop there. Um, and we've just proved that there's an entire big class of polynomials 
that can't generate just primes or the nth prime. Um, but some of you might be thinking mm, that 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 restraint on the coefficients being um, whole numbers, bit 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 much. So let's think about rational coefficients. So imagine that they have the freedom to be fractions like three quarters or four fifths or something like that. This time, instead of saying we still have p1 like before, we just need to modify the proof just a little bit. Instead of plugging in 1 plus p1 into the polynomial, we'll say 1 plus k times p1. Just introduce an extra factor and we can write it all out just like before. And then we can collect those terms and they'll be the ones that are just a plus b plus c plus d and so on, which we know is p1. But that second bit is not p1 times x, it's k times p1 times x. Now, x is not necessarily a whole number anymore. It's a combination of rational coefficients multiplied together. If you write it out, you'll see it. M multiplied and added together. Now that means that we can choose a k so that all those denominators are cancelled out. And one way to do that, there's lots of ways we could do that, but one way to do that is k can be the lowest common multiple of all the um, coefficients, their, their, um, their, their, denom their denominators. Let's just illustrate that idea. So we've said p1 plus k dot p1 equals p1 1 plus k x. Now our logic before was this thing is supposed to be prime. It's a multiple of this thing and this thing. And previously we said well that's a whole number and that's a whole number. So this thing can't be a prime. That was the contradiction. Now we've got a k. This is still a whole number, but is this thing still a whole number? Well, one is x now is a sum. It's a sum of terms which are combinations of those rational coefficients. So it could be something like x could be k times x, let's say it could be three quarters as an example. We can pick k to be four and that means cancels out, it becomes a whole number. So we can pick a k to make this thing a whole number and then our proof continues as before. If we can make this a whole number, this thing here is no longer prime and therefore that polynomial can be made to generate none primes, therefore proving that that polynomial of that form, you know, we said can it only generate primes and we've proved that it doesn't. Great, so that proves the case that if we allow those coefficients to be rational we can still reach the same conclusion that polynomials with rational coefficients can't generate only prime numbers, never mind the nth prime number. Fantastic, I hope that was uh, interesting. Um, it's a question that often pops up, you know, um, for, for kind of beginners like myself, you know, can, can we generate the nth prime with a simple, simple formula? And we've looked at one kind of simple formula and proved that this kind can't. Fantastic, we'll see you next time, bye.